Our scripture this morning is going to be coming from the book of Acts. We've been in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3 is the book that we're going to be studying from today. And Acts 3, we're going to be just looking at a few verses, and then I'll give some context to these verses. We're going to start at verse 5, and it reads this. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. For the time that we have together today, I want to talk to you from the thought, how may I serve you? Let's say that together. How may I serve you? One of the things that I love to experience, I love some good customer service. Yeah, when, when I go out to eat, I not only am expecting a delicious, well-prepared meal, but I'm also looking for excellent service. I, I like to be greeted with a welcoming smile, and I like to be greeted with a I'm so glad that you're here. And, and I like for the waiter or the waitress to treat me as if they were happy to see me. <laughs> but have you ever experienced going somewhere to eat and the waiter or waitress was a little less hospitable? Maybe not quite as inviting as you think a waiter should be. Well, I, I believe that it is a beautiful thing when we live our lives in a space to serve others. I believe that we should maintain the attitude and the conviction and, and operate the same way we would want to be treated. That when we enter into a relationship with someone or when we meet someone that we approach them with the attitude of saying, how can I be of service to you? So often when we meet people Unfortunately, the first thing that many times comes natural is to wonder, how can this person benefit me? What kind of value can they bring in my life? Well, we have started a study on the book of Acts, and we have, have discovered one important thing, and that is this is a book that describes the acts of Jesus through his people that are filled with his spirit. And I believe that when we function the way God intended, that we would follow his lead and follow what he intends for his church. We started this particular book to get an understanding and a discovery of God's original design for his church. And I believe that with God's original design for his church, that he wants us to be servants that he wants us to be willing to use the purpose of our lives to serve others. We've asserted that at the end of the day, we want to establish something very clearly, that the purpose of the church is to expand the kingdom of God and that the way we expand the kingdom of God is that we share the good news with people that we meet. And then we've also established that there are five functions to that end. There are five things that we're doing that, as the church in order to, to share the love of Jesus, in order for the kingdom of God to be expanded. We talked about how we, we are, that there should be discipleship happening, that there should be worship, that there should be fellowship, that there should be missions. And finally, what we're talking about today, there should be ministry. So when I use the word ministry, I want us to all be on the same page to understand what exactly do I mean when I use the word ministry. The word ministry 
means to serve. It means to attend to the needs of others. So if you ever wanted to keep in your mind to have a mind picture of what it is to minister or what it means to be in ministry, think about a waiter or a waitress. That, that I am not there to make friends. I am not there to hang out and relax or to look at my phone. I am there to wait hand and foot on those that I am serving. And not only am I waiting hand and foot on those that I'm serving, but I am also serving with a smile. My attitude is good. I like when I meet someone in a service context that has a good attitude. Kind of like when we go to Chick-fil-A. Anybody like to go to Chick-fil-A? <laughs> when I go to Chick-fil-A, I'm amazed at how happy they seem to be when I roll up in the drive-thru. They standing out there in the heat, hot, dressed up, smiling. When, when, they in, when I get ready to give them my order, they say, sir, how can I delight you with great service today? And then after I place my order, they say what? My pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Man, what, what if God's people served that way? What if the way we approached ministry was from the conviction that we are waiting, we are attending to those whom we serve? You see, when I talk about what ministry is, I want it to be clear that we're talking about to serve and to attend to the needs of another. Something else that I want to establish and make clear is that when we hear the idea of ministers, many times in the church we think of ministers as the pastor. We think of ministers as the deacon. We think of ministers as the other people and not the quote-unquote lay people. But the reality is that in God's church, there are no lay people because we are all ministers. We are all servants. I love the way Martin Luther King said it. He said, anyone can be great because anyone can serve. So we establish what is ministry, and we establish that as ministers of the gospel, we are servants. So I want to give you a definition of what it means to be a minister. A minister is one who serves the needs of another. And then, now let me go a little deeper. It's one who exec executes the commands of another. So when I am a minister, I am executing the commands of another. And if I can go a little deeper, a minister is a servant of the king. I want you to know today that if Jesus Christ is your Lord, you are a minister of the king. That means that I have been placed, the, the beauty and the blessing and the privilege has been placed on me as a disciple of Christ, as a born-again child of God. I have been made a minister. I am a servant of the king. Can we say that together? I'm a servant. Yes, I, I'm a servant of the king. My, I'm talking to you today is how may I serve you? So when we think about one of the functions and the purpose uh, of the church, serving can oftentimes get lost. When I think about the times that I've had less than perfect customer service, and my mind goes back to a few weeks ago when I went to Cracker Barrel. And I like their pecan pancakes and it's a little eggs with a side of crispy. I make sure I tell them, make sure it's crispy. Crispy potatoes. Anybody like their potatoes crispy? <laughs> And, and when I was waiting, sitting there waiting on the waitress to take my order, I noticed something. She went to the table of the last people that she had served, and she picked up the money that they had left, and she shook her head. She shook her head in disgust and said, ah, oh. <laughs> she, she jammed it into our pocket. And can you imagine, let me, can you take a guess of what kind of service we got? <laughs> our service was less than perfect, to say the least, to put it lightly. And I think a lot of times why we find ourselves not serving with the heart of compassion, the heart of the Father, is because we have things going on in life. 
And there are two things that I want to highlight quickly as we get ready to, to get into our story. Uh, there were two things I want to highlight of why we oftentimes fail to serve in a way that honors God, that brings glory to the one who gave us the command. And the first thing that I want to highlight is that we just, we're busy. Life is so busy. I, anybody out here, if anyone watching, can, can you attest to the fact that your life is, it just seems to be so busy. It seems to be that I have so many things going on, so many things that's, that's getting in my way that, that I'm, I'm so busy that I'm distracted from life. The second thing that I believe causes us to, to uh, fail to serve in a way that brings honor to God is that I think that we've just simply lost sight of our purpose. You see, our purpose, we were created as, as children of God. We have the privilege of being servants. That when I wake up in the morning, one of the first things that I should do is say, God, how may I serve you? How can I be a blessing to other people? Because I found that when we serve others, we are serving God. So let's take a look at our text this morning and see if we could extract and exegete some ideas of how do we serve in a way that brings glory and honor to God. But before, before we do, let me ask you a question. How many of you enjoy excellent customer service? Uh, anyone? I, you, do you enjoy excellent customer service? Well, then guess what? If we enjoy receiving it, then we should enjoy giving it. You are in the service industry. <laughs> you have been called by God to serve. What a privilege and an honor. So in our text this morning, the Bible opens up in Acts chapter 3. It opens with a story about two men who were, uh, their names were Peter and John. And the Bible says that Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, one of the first things that we want to establish and be very clear about is that in order for me to function and to be a person of, uh, th that ministers unto the Lord, that serves well, we must be people of prayer. These men, they were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. And see, in Jewish uh, custom, they would pray three times a day. They would pray at 9 a.m., they would pray at 3 p.m., and finally at sunset. And these men were on their way to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer. In other words, they stopped everything that they were doing, if they were at work, if they were at the grocery store, if they were on their way to the video store, they stopped what they were doing and they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. I believe that's a good word today. I believe that if we find ourselves pausing in the middle of our day to acknowledge God's goodness, that if we pause in the middle of our day so that we can pray and thank God for his goodness, I believe that it will keep us in the mindset that we are here to serve. See, the idea of being a minister is a noun. It, it means that I am, right? So what I want to encourage and challenge us today is that when I am reminding myself of who I am, then out of that will come action. It will come the verb of being a minister or ministering to God's people. They must, we must be people of prayer. And one of the things that I found really compelling as I studied through this is that the way the structure of the prayers that they would render unto God was this. First, they would take the first few minutes and reflect on God's goodness. They would think about God's power. They would think about his name is great. Maybe they will say things like, uh, as I enter into his gates with thanksgiving, I enter his courts with praise. Maybe they will say things like, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous shall run in and be safe. Maybe they think and reflect on how, how God is an awesome, strong God. That maybe like what David said in Psalm 27, that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Maybe as they pray, they begin to think about how big God is. And I think that's important. That before I get ready to ask God for anything, let me reflect on how big he is. 
Let me de declare how awesome he is. And then after they have reflected on God's goodness, then they went into their request. They asked God for what they needed. And then after they've asked God for what they needed, then they begin to rejoice. They begin to worship. They begin to thank God that it was already done. I believe this is a great principle and a great um, uh, outlook on how we can pray. In order for us to be true ministers uh, of the Lord, serving with, a, with an attitude of grace and love, is that we would be people of prayer. Next, next thing that I notice about this text is that it says this, that when these men entered into the temple at the hour of prayer, they saw a man that had been laid at this entrance of this gate, at the entrance of this temple. It was called the gate called Beautiful. And what's interesting about this particular day is that this man, the Bible says that this man was laid daily at the gate. And if these men, which I believe they were, were consistent in their prayers, then that means that they encountered this man a few times a day. But on this day, this was something special. On this day, something miraculous is about to take place. And I want to in encourage and, and, and just encourage all of us today to know that don't, let's just take something out of our vocabulary. When someone asks you, how is your day? Let's not say us. Same old, same old, because the Bible teaches that this is the day that the Lord has made and that we should rejoice and be glad in it. Do you know that you are one step closer to a breakthrough? You are one step closer to an experience that you will never forget. I don't know about you, but I want to encourage you to wake up each day with an air of expectation. That you can wake up and say, God, I don't know if the day is the day, but I believe that you're able Maybe today is the day that coronavirus will disappear. Maybe today is the day that that family member that you've been praying for will finally surrender their heart. Maybe today is the day that you finally experience a breakthrough in your heart where you've been wrestling with God. But I want to encourage you today, family, that every day that we get to see on this side of heaven is a blessing. Every day that we get to in inhale and exhale is a privilege from God. Amen. So we don't want to take any day lightly, but every day we must enter into our days with expectation. And, and this, these guys, we find that they were excellent ministers. And so we see that they're, number one, they were people of prayer. But number two, here's what we find. They were sensitive to the needs of others. You see, when Peter and John were getting ready to go into the temple, there was a man sitting there begging. And this man, the Bible says, was born lame. And really, this, this man is an image of who we were at one time. If you have received Jesus as Lord of your life, and you have surrendered your heart to him, then you are no longer lame, but you are healed. You are delivered. You are whole. Well, this man is a picture of what it is to be before Christ. This man was born lame. Do you know that all of us were born sinners? David declares that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That means that without Jesus, we would, there's, a, there's a cradle to, to prison pipeline. That when we were born, we were born into sin, shaped in iniquity. And our lives, if not interrupted by Jesus, would, we would on, be on our way to eternal damnation. But because of the selfless sacrifice and serving of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we are no longer lame. Somebody shout, I'm not lame anymore. Yes, Lord, I'm not lame anymore. But they encountered this man that was lame. He was laid at the gate. This is why as a church, our, our mission is that we are leading people, searching for more, into a thriving relationship with Christ. So we see what this, this man was lame, and all he wanted was just a piece of change in order to get him something to eat later on in the night. All he wanted was a little money so that he can pay his little bills. All he wanted was a little money so he could have a place to sleep. And I'm here to tell you that life is bigger than that. Life is bigger than a job. 
Life is bigger than a house. It is bigger than clothes and, and what to eat. No, God knows that we need all of that stuff. And God doesn't want us just from day to day living, and I'm just trying to make, make ends meet and, and all that. No, Jesus said, I come that you might have life, and that life more abundantly. And you know what I believe? Marks an abundant life beyond stuff, beyond possessions. You know what I believe marks a, an, an abundant life? It is a life of purpose. It is a life of meaning. That when I wake up each day, what drives me out of my bed each day is, is not to go and make money, but it's so that I can live in purpose. That, that I can experience who God has called me to be. I don't know about you, but I don't want to leave this earth with all of this gifting and ability on the inside of me. Okay. And this is what the disciples had an opportunity to experience. They looked at this man, and this man, the Bible says, Peter said, look at us, look at us. And when the man looked at them, the scripture says that he looked at them expecting, somebody shout expecting. He looked at them expecting to receive something. And what, they were, what he was expecting to receive had to have been uh, some kind of money. Had to have been something that he, would, that he could put his hands on. Something that he could see. But the scripture says that Peter and John were sensitive. And they said something that might have disappointed the man. They said, well, we don't have any gold or silver. And have you ever tried to give someone that was on the side of the road begging something other than money? <laughs> I, I, I've, uh, I've said, hey, brother, I, I, I have a, a hamburger here for you that I want to give to you. And I, I had a man look at me like I had given him a snake. <laughs> like, man, I didn't want this. <laughs> well, I, I thought that what you wanted was, was some, some food. But the reality is that a lot of times people don't know what they want. A lot of times people don't know what they need. It was Henry Ford that said, if I would have asked the average American what was it that they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. But he said, people don't know what they need until they see it. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something that you've never seen before. I'm going to create an automobile. And, and that automobile is going to exceed your expectation. You see, when people are in search for more, when people are hungry and thirsty, and when the world cannot satisfy, it is incumbent upon God's people for us to know that we have in us what people need. Because, see, Peter said, we don't have any silver or gold. But then he said something that struck me. He said, but what I do have, I give to you. Can I ask you a question today? The question that I posed, I said, what was it that Peter had that he was going to give this man? What was it that he had that, that would defy this man's expectation? G Peter had Jesus. Peter had Jesus. And while that may not sound like a whole lot, let me tell you today, family, that in the name of Jesus, there is so much more than what we realize. In the name of Jesus, there's so much more that we have access to. He, we have access in the name of Jesus. We have what the Bible calls a ministry of reconciliation. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5, the scripture says that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. That we have been given a ministry that says we want to be a bridge between a holy God and a sinful people. That we could help pe bridge the gap between the separation from God. My question today, what was it that Peter had that he was going to give this man? He gave him Jesus the Bible says that Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see, not only did, he, did Peter have the name of Jesus, but Peter also had the authority that the name of Jesus brings. 
Do you see, I, I believe that there's authority in the name of Jesus that we have not quite tapped into. That we have just lost sense and understanding of what the name of Jesus truly means. Many years ago, we were out witnessing and canvassing the neighborhood, and, and I was across the street, and I looked across, turned around, looked across the street, and it was a big old pit bull running towards one of our dear sisters, Sister Deborah, and he was running at her like he was about to attack her. And the only thing that I could think about was, in the name of Jesus, and when I said that, the dog stopped. And he turned around, he looked at me, and the first thought I had was, oh. <laughs> and that I'm, I'm diverting his attention from her and now on me. And that dog turned around, and he looked, he had big old strong looking scary dog. And that dog looked, and he was confused. And he was stopped in his tracks. And what I'm here to tell you today is that we have power in the name of Jesus. That we as the church must reconnect to the power that rests in the name and the authority of Jesus. You see, in Luke chapter 10, the Bible says that Jesus told his disciples, I give you power. I give you authority to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and upon all the power. Somebody shout all. All the power of the enemy. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I got it all together because I'll be honest with you. There are some things that intimidate me. There are some things that frighten me. There are some things, times that, that God has in, encouraged me to be a minister, to witness to somebody. And I said, well, I just, <laughs> I, I, I don't quite know what to say, Lord. I'm not sure. I'm, and I've talked myself out of it. But I'm here to tell you that when we engage in a constant, consistent, ongoing prayer with our Heavenly Father, that it will build us up. See, as a church, we've said that we're going to stop every day at 8 p.m. and pray together. And it's not something we're just doing because we, you know, we don't have anything better. But what we're saying is this, that God wants to restore order and purpose in his church. That as the church, we have maybe lost sight of what we're here for. Maybe we've lost sight of the fact that every member of the body of Christ is a minister that's called to serve, that's commanded to serve. You see, I believe that what, what, what stirred Peter and John to raise this man up out of his lameness is because they recall their own lameness. See, I find that some of the best ministers that, that, that press into their purpose is that they're always aware and there's always a conviction of what God has done for them. <laughs> that it wasn't their good ideas or their good behavior or their intelligence that lifted them up out of their place of lameness. That it was by the power of God that raised them up. I believe that it's important that we stop every now and again and think about how far God has brought us from. I, I believe that it's important for us to remember that I remember when I used to be separated from God. I remember what life was like when I tried to do things on my own. I remember when I thought if I can make just a little bit more money, that it will satisfy this craving in my soul. But when, I con when I'm convinced that God delivered me and raised me up out of this place, it will give me compassion. See, I think sometimes in the church what we have gotten to the place is that we look down on people that are not where they need to be. That we look down on the, pe the, the, the woman who looks like the prostitute. We look down on people that, 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 that smoking weed. And we, we look down on people that have a drug problem. We look down on people that have a drinking problem. We look down on people that, that find themselves in the bed with every other person. We look down because we have gotten to the place to where we're, oh, I'm not there anymore. But family, listen, if it had not been for the grace of God. 
where would I be? And if I were you, I, won't you take a moment just to celebrate where God has brought you from? Come on, won't you think about where he's brought you from and the places that he's brought you out of? Won't you celebrate that? And that should drive us to be concerned for our fellow brothers. This man... was lame. Peter, the Bible says, I don't have what you think you need. I don't, I don't have what you want. All I have is, is Jesus, and, and, and I'm going to give this to you for free. Jesus told his disciples very simply, he said, you have received freely. Now, I need you to do something. I want you to give it freely. Give it with the sense of, Generosity, which is our final thought, that we want to be generous. When we're asking the question today as, as ministers of, of the gospel of Jesus, how do we serve well? First, we found that we must be people of prayer. Secondly, we, we've discovered that we must be sensitive to the needs of others. And finally, we're saying today that we must be generous. And where, does a, where does a heart of generosity come from? It comes from when you realize everything that you have, and I mean everything, comes from God. I mean everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. It's not because of my hard work or my good activity. No, it's because of God's goodness. And as a result of his goodness, it compels me to give. Because when I have, the more Jesus that I am able to, to handle the more Jesus that I'm able to to, to my spirit man to expand to, to receive because he's inexhaustible right the, the more I expand to receive the more he fills me up and the more I become full of Jesus what begins to pour out of me is his goodness it's the generosity of the Lord and it says this I like the way it says it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, Paul says this. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given for me to make the word of God fully known. What that encourages me there is that he, Paul sees that th what Jesus has done for us, he sees it as a, a source of stewardship. That what God has given to me, that I treat it in a way that says, God, I want to honor you with it. I want to honor you with my time. God, I want to honor you with my talents. And I sure enough want to honor you with my treasure. I want to honor you. I want to give over to my everything about my life. I want to give. You see, I'll be honest with you that I'm not super generous with my time. I'm not very flexible with my time. I don't like my time interrupted. But these men, on their way to the temple at our prayer, were willing to be interrupted. A few years back, we were on our way to, to church and saw an opportunity to minister. But I'm sad to say that I said, I can't, I don't have time to minister. I got to get to church. <laughs> You know, that is something that God is working with me on, that I want you to use your time and be willing to be generous with your time, to hold everything that you have with an open hand. And I, I want to ask you today, is there anything that, that we hold so near, so tightly, that we clutch so near and dear to, that it hinders us from being generous, from being gracious, I mentioned to you that I love excellent customer service. And I went with some friends one evening to IHOP. And I ordered my stuff. And I, and I could be kind of a hard person to please when it comes to ordering my food. Because I, I, I heard a little extra grunt back here. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> but I, I order stuff that's not even on the menu. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, when I go to an establishment, I don't even look at the menu. I sit there, cross my arms, and, and I just wait to see how I'm going to be served. And the, and, and the waiter walks up and says, Mr. Campbell, how, uh, wait, uh, welcome to IHOP. Thank you for being here today. What would you like to order? And I just start telling them, well, I'm going to be honest with you. I hadn't looked at the menu, so, but this is what I want. And I start telling them all of that, and he's writing it down, and he's, but that man handled it so well. And when, when I left, I gave him a real good tip, y'all. I tip well anyway. Even if I get poor service, I give 20% off the top, no matter what. But if the service is good, the tip goes even higher. And, and the thing about it is that as a waiter, I imagine what you have to keep your eye on is you have to keep your eye on the reward. You have to keep your eye on the prize. You have to keep your eye on, even if I don't get great uh, tips on this one, if I continue to have a good attitude, I'm going to get some great tips eventually. And I believe that as ministers of the gospel, we must serve with the conviction that we're going to get not just a tip, but we're going to get a reward. Because we serve a God that sent his, sent his only begotten son, his name is Jesus, that was literally the suffering servant that came and laid his life down for us. And his life that he laid down for us, we are recipients of. And so as a result of what he's done, we serve with a sense of expectation that someday we're going to stand before God and he's going to utter these beautiful words, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Family, we are called to be servants. Every last one of us are called to serve. And while it might not always be easy or it may be challenging at times, I want you to know that what causes us to give, and this is our big idea today, what causes us to give is that as ministers, we are compelled to give away what Jesus has given to us. We're compelled to give away what Jesus has given to us. I worked in nonprofit for seven years. And in nonprofit, there's grants that you get. And the objective of the grant is to spend the money. You, you have to spend the money into the allotted categories. And at the end of that grant year, you need to have spent all of the money. In other words, you are a distribution center. The money comes in, and it needs to go out. Well, you know what? God has sent his spirit into our hearts, and out of our hearts must come a sense of service, a commitment to ask the question, how may I serve you? And then after we've served, and whether we got a good customer or not, we want to respond, it was my pleasure.